What if I told you that a people's national and regional pride would be linked to the success of their sports team? That winning a World Cup would be glorified in one country, but disputed elsewhere? What if I told you that a government would create one of sport's great rivalries? What if I told you that men representing the success of a national system were not all born in that nation? That members of a losing team would become national heroes? What if I told you that it was all part of a dictator's plan? That his actions would set a precedent for history's most infamous figure to follow. The Stadio Olimpico in Rome, home to two of Italy's top teams. Since 1953, AS Roma and SS Lazio have shared the stadium and one of the greatest rivalries in Italian football. The Derby de la Capitale is one of the biggest sporting events in Rome each year. Fans of these teams hate each other, and allegiance to one club is often part of a modern Roman's identity. However, something that today's fans don't focus on is the history behind the rivalry. This great clash of Italian football was created by Benito Mussolini's fascist regime. In October of 1922, Mussolini and members of his National Fascist Party marched on Rome and demanded the resignation of the Liberal Prime Minister. A few days later, Mussolini was appointed as Italy's new Prime Minister with the expectation of restoring law and order to the country. In the coming years, Mussolini and his fascist regime would come to control all aspects of Italian life. Mussolini would often use propaganda to achieve his goals. Benito Mussolini and his regime wanted to restore the glory of Rome making the capital city the hub of Italian pride. He presented himself as the new Augustus, and like Roman emperors of the past, he understood the power of entertainment. Not unlike the ancient Romans, 20th century Italians enjoyed sport and athletic competition. Football was their favorite pastime. Following the First World War, teams from Italy's north dominated the game. Northern clubs from Turin, Milan, Genoa, and Piedmont won Italy's championship annually. This, of course, did not fit Mussolini's vision of having Rome as the hub of fascist Italy. In the summer of 1927, the regime sought to change the power of Italian football and create a super club in Rome, one that could not only compete with, but beat the northern clubs. Italo Foschi, a secretary of the National Fascist Party, organized a merger among Rome's several professional clubs. The best players from each team came together to create AS Roma. Only one club in Rome resisted the merger. This club was SS Lazio. Based on the regime's aspirations to connect fascism to ancient Rome, it came as no surprise to see the Capitolan She-Wolf become the symbol for the new team. While AS Roma did not win a Scudetto until 1942, the regime's plan worked. Just two years after the club's creation, AS Roma had the highest attendance in the country. In 1931, the club would finish in second place, a major accomplishment. Since AS Roma's creation, the club's rivalry with SS Lazio has been one of the fiercest in Italy, a rivalry created by Mussolini's regime. While AS Roma inspired the regional pride of Italians living near the capital, only one team could capture the devotion and attention of the entire country. This was the Azzurri. Italy's national team. The first World Cup was held in Uruguay in 1930. Italy did not participate as sending its athletes all the way to Uruguay was too costly. France was the only European country to travel to South America. Despite the lack of European countries, the first World Cup was seen as an overwhelming success. The host nation defeated Argentina to win the first ever tournament, but the success and popularity of the 1930 World Cup ensured that future competitions would follow. Two years later, FIFA executives met to plan the next World Cup. Looking to show off his fascist country to the world, Mussolini saw the World Cup as an opportunity. Two nations submitted a bid, Sweden and Mussolini's Italy. On October 9, 1932, FIFA accepted Italy's bid. Teams representing 16 countries would travel to Italy to compete in the 1934 World Cup. 
This was Mussolini and Italy's chance to shine. The government selected eight host cities to represent the country. Matches were played in Bologna, Florence, Genoa, Milan, Naples, Tristi, Turin, and of course, Rome. Many of these games took place in brand new stadiums built and funded by the fascist regime. The Italian national team was considered one of the very best in the world entering the 1934 World Cup. Six years earlier, a young Italian team had won the bronze medal at the 1928 Olympics. Now more experienced, the team was considered one of the tournament favorites. The Italian team was led by goalkeeper Gian Piero Combi, forward Angelo Schiavano, defender Luis Monti, and center forward Giuseppe Miazza, considered four of the best players in the world at their positions. Benito Mussolini marked the special occasion by raising the stakes. The tournament winners would not only receive the World Cup trophy, but would also be presented with the Copa del Duce, a trophy commissioned by Mussolini that was six times larger than the World Cup trophy. Mussolini did everything in his power to ensure that both trophies would stay in fascist Italy. He took control of organizing every aspect of the 1934 World Cup, including the selection of the referees for each match. In the first round of the tournament, Italy dominated the United States in a 7-1 win. Shaviano scored three of the host nation's goals. The second round saw Italy face a young but very talented Spanish team. The match ended in a 1-1 tie, meaning that the teams would compete in a replay the next day. Italy won the second match 1-0, but the game had numerous controversial calls, all going in Italy's favor. The performances of the referees in both matches against Spain were widely criticized by non-Italian reporters. The criticism was so harsh that the referees were suspended from officiating upon returning to their home nations after the World Cup. Nevertheless, Italy moved on to the semifinals with the nation caught up in supporting their journey. The tournament was turning out to be everything Mussolini dreamed of. In the semifinals, Italy faced its biggest challenge of the tournament, the World Cup favorite, Austria. The Austrians were renowned for their quick tempo pace and skillful passing. However, a storm the day before the match turned Milan San Siro Stadium into a muddy mess. This disrupted Austria's ability to play the game in their style. This was not the only factor that worked in Italy's favor. Reporters covering the match alleged that Mussolini had a private dinner the night before with the match's referee to discuss football tactics. Nothing was proven, but many reporters believed the match had been fixed. Italy won the match 1-0 with another disputed goal, as many spectators thought that Enrique Ghiatta scored from an offside position. Italy moved on to the World Cup Finals in Rome. The Azzurri faced a relatively inexperienced Czechoslovakian team. Mussolini chose the same official from Italy's semi-final match against Austria to referee the final. Before the match, Mussolini invited the referee up to his VIP box to meet with him once again. The two assistant referees officiating the final were from Italy's quarterfinal win over Spain. The Czechoslovakian team heard the rumors of the match's corruption. Before the game started, it seemed the Czechs were up against not only the Italians and the fans, but also the referees. Despite this, the Czechs took a 1-0 lead in the 71st minute, but 10 minutes later, Raimundo Orsi tied the game, which forced it into extra time. Italy's Angelo Schiavano scored the World Cup winning goal in the 95th minute. Mussolini himself presented the victorious Italian players with their winner's medals and the trophies. Italy's World Cup victory was glorified throughout the country. The fascist party's newspapers praised the players' courage, discipline, order, and teamwork, saying that they were qualities all Italians should aspire to. The winning players were treated as heroes. Thousands of people lined the street of Rome to celebrate the victory with a parade. The victory put Italian and fascist pride at an all-time high. Not only was the national team the toast of Italy, the successful World Cup also cemented Mussolini's popularity among the Italian people. To celebrate victory was to celebrate fascism. Mussolini used the team's victory as a means of propaganda, proof that his nation was superior. While the participants of the 1934 World Cup were certainly among the game's elite teams, one nation was glaringly absent from the tournament, football's inventors, England. In 1928, the English Football Association withdrew from FIFA due to political differences. England did not compete in the first two World Cups. Despite not playing in the World Cup, the English national team was considered by many as the best team in the world, especially given the contentious nature of Italy's victory. 
In November 1934, the two football giants met. The game dubbed the Battle of Highbury pitted the World Cup champions against an English team that had not lost a game in two years. Before the match, top Italian journalist Bruno Rogi described Highbury as a theater of international war. Many papers throughout Europe discussed the game as an unofficial playoff, with the match's winner to be viewed as the best team in the world. For fascist Italy, this game was crucial. A victory over cultural rivals England would be an example of fascism's superiority. The match lived up to its pregame height, and it was a very physical affair. Four English players went to the hospital after the game with injuries, but one player couldn't finish the match. In the second minute of the game, Italy's star defender Luis Monti broke his leg. Football at this time did not allow any substitutions, so Monti tried to play through his injury until he could not bear the pain any longer in the 15th minute. By the time of Monti's departure, England led 3-0, exploiting Monti's injury in all three of their goals. Italy would have to come back while playing a man down for the rest of the game, a nearly impossible task. In the second half, Giuseppe Miazza stepped up and scored two goals in four minutes. He was denied an equalizing third goal by the post and several impressive saves by English goalkeeper Frank Moss. Despite their best efforts, Italy could not complete the comeback. Surprisingly, the loss did not prevent Italian news media from glorifying the team's efforts. After seeing Italy play the majority of the game a man down, Rogi claimed the Italian players played like a platoon of gladiators and argued that this defeat was worth twice as much as victory. The national team players were dubbed the Lions of Highbury and were treated as heroes upon their return to Italy. The team lost the game, a reality that the fascist regime seemed to ignore. The players were made to represent everything that it meant to be Italian. There was just one problem. Not all the players were born in Italy. Five players on Italy's World Cup winning team that represented fascist superiority were not born in Italy. Antilio de Maria, Enrique Giatta, Ramundo Orsi, and even Luis Monte were born in Argentina. Filo Garrisi was Brazilian. Orisi had scored the game-winning goal in the 1934 World Cup final. Some of Italy's biggest heroes were not pure Italians. Four years later, Italy would go on to defend their World Cup success with another victory in 1938, defeating France, Brazil, and Hungary en route to their triumph. For the regime, the two World Cup successes were proof that fascist Italians were superior. Italy's success in hosting and winning the 1934 World Cup inspired pride throughout the country. For fans, Italy's team was proof that the country was superior on a global stage. Mussolini used the tournament as propaganda and showed the world the success of his fascist system. Another dictator would try to emulate the 1934 World Cup two years later. He was Adolf Hitler, whose Nazi Germany hosted the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. He would use Mussolini's actions as precedent for his mega event and tried to show the world the strength of his Nazi party. Sport is a powerful aspect of life. It garners the attention of numerous fans. With that comes a dangerous reality. Sport can be used as a piece of propaganda. Mussolini is a prime example of this. In the process, his fascist regime created the great AS Roma SS Lazio rivalry, and it also glorified the 1934 and 1938 World Cup winners. During his reign, Mussolini changed Italian football forever and used it to instill pride in his people. 